So I'm just waiting for everybody to um, have a couple of minutes to, to join and um, I'll be starting shortly. Welcome everybody. I can see there are people coming on board. So I'm just gonna wait one more minute and then we can get started. Okay, so since we have a lot, um, I have a lot that I want to share um, today, I'm gonna get started. My name is Sophie Wade. I um, am the founder and work innovation specialist at Flexel Network. And it's all about workforce innovation and I founded it uh, in 2011, so uh, nine years ago. And it's really looking at how we need to be adapting uh, the workforce for the future of work. Well, the future of work really is right now. And so this is the moment which we are, I've been sort of waiting for, but, and it's been accelerated and accelerated in, in an extraordinary way that, that, is, that, is, that is pretty challenging. It has been technology that has been driving most of the change and society, but now we also have crisis. So change can come from a variety of factors. So let's get started. But right now, I just want to, to share with you, it's going to be one hour long. The presentation itself is going to be about 45 minutes. I want to make sure that we have time for questions. You will be participating. So if you have um, a pen or pa pad or whatever you, you choose to write notes on, please have that because this is about you, not about me. I will be taking two breaks for questions, one in the middle, and there'll be another time at the end. And please don't use the chat to ask questions. I'll be looking in the Q&A Q Q &A for your questions um, and you can upvote them so you know, I know which, which ones to focus on. Okay, so what, what is leadership? What does leadership mean? Well, I think there are, there are many different types of leader that we have become used to. That, um, this man is uh, maybe look familiar to, to, to some of you in terms of what we expect to see sometimes in a leader, it's a lot, been a lot about command and control. We've had that type of leadership for over a hundred years. It is, I pay you to turn up, I tell you what to do. You know, where that hasn't actually been working that effectively for a long time, but that is what we have been used to. But there are also um, certain types of, of leaders. I do, I always like to start with a, with a bit of a cartoon. And if you can't read that, it says, I will crush you. So there are many different types of leaders and I did study Chinese and Lao Tzu also has, proposes another type of leader, a leader who is not doing the command and control thing, but supporting their, the people and the, the, the people that work for, work, work for the leader in a different way. So what are we looking at here? What type of leader are you? This is what I'd like to find out. So this is the first batch of questions that I'm going to, to pose. These are not, we don't have to spend a lot of time. I just want to spend about 20, 30 seconds, give you about 20 seconds to really just have a look at some of these things. It's really just trying to identify the type of organization that you have, the type of leadership model that probably, that, that may well exist in your organization and how you are as a leader right now. So just to get a baseline that we can, we can move forward from. Um, we're going to be going through a lot of different things and many different questions. And there'll be a lot more work that you can do afterwards when you have the questions and you're sort of thinking back to the, the questions that I asked at the beginning here. But I want to create a baseline so, so we understand the type of leader that you are and how you can, can transform from that and, and lead your teams and your department, your division better as we go forward in, in this time of uncertainty. So what situation are we dealing with right now? As I've said, the future of work is right now. It has been accelerated by the situations that we've been dealing with in terms of COVID, in terms of, of needing to work in extraordinarily different ways. And as we move forward from here, whilst most countries, most cities, most populations have been in uh, lockdown. We are now, countries have been opening up in different cities, in different ways, <clears throat> in different countries. Denmark, Sweden never had a, always had a little bit of a, 
a different um, approach to the restrictions, but in different countries all over the place, in different states in the United States, we have been seeing uh, lockdown easing, restrictions easing, and having very different parameters depending on where you are. So this is an extraordinary amount of uncertainty in terms of how people need to be approaching what, how you're going to be, how you're going to be working, how you're going to be leading your team because of where they are. Are they all going to be in the office? Are some of them going to be in the office? How can we deal with this and, and really try and understand how to support people and enable people to do their best work? Well, uncertainty can also show up in all kinds of different ways. And I certainly didn't expect to be sitting here in front of you showing you this picture. This is what I saw this morning when I went out at 6 a.m. this morning because uncertainty can have many different flavors to it. And we, have, we are experiencing in the United States. This is from New York. I live in Soho and this is what I saw this morning. And uh, so there's a whole bunch more, there's a lot more uncertainty that we're dealing with right now in terms of how we're going to conduct ourselves and how we're going to be anticipating people going to the office in the morning. Extraordinary in terms of how we're needing to adapt and be flexible and be able to, to manage our, our teams and our, our companies in these situations. Because in fact, I went out at six o'clock, by nine o'clock, all of those windows had been replaced and that, that bank was getting back to business again. So how can we deal with these type of situations? How can we be ready and be ready and um, primed to iterate, to be flexible? I'll t share a little story with you. Um, I did this uh, about, uh, well, several years ago, I went zip lining with my son. We were in Scotland, went to, went to a venture park and he wanted to do it. And I said, yeah, okay, fine. So within seconds, you know, we're up 30 feet up the tree. He's gone off and I've just zip lined and I'm suddenly thinking, what, what on earth am I doing here? I couldn't believe it. And I love these kind of things, but I, was, I suddenly was really, really, really not sure that I was doing the right thing. But I couldn't go back. So I had to step out onto these pieces of wood. I don't know how many of you have actually done zip lining, but you have pieces of wood which are strung up by ropes and you, you do have a harness, but the pieces of wood are going like this and the ropes are going like that. And by the time I got to the end of the first section, I was not quite freaking out, but I was grabbing onto the, the tree for, 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 uh, for my, my life. And my heart was in my mouth. I was finding it very, very challenging, but I couldn't go back. So I had to keep going forward. And the next section that I stepped out onto, then I was finding that that was, I was starting to understand how the pieces of wood moved, how I needed to grab hold onto, when I could change grip. And I wasn't quite as panicked by the time I got to the end of that section. And the one after that was even easier. And by the third or the, the fourth or the fifth, I actually got the hang of it. And I was starting to enjoy the adventure. What were they going to challenge me with next? I had worked out how to deal with the kind of unpredictability, the, the instability that each one of these sections presented, had presented me with, I now had got used to it. So we do have an ability to get used to the type of situations we're dealing with, but we also need to recognize what each one of those means. We have in the past been living, been, been working in, in, in situations and environments that we were all familiar with because we were all experiencing them together. Now, we have very, very different and unfamiliar situations. And now we, although we have most of us been in lockdown, each one of our situations at home has been very different. Some people have small, small apartments, others have big houses. Some people are completely alone. Others have their children on top of them. We've all been dealing and struggling and trying to work it out as best we can. And now situations are changing again. Some people are going to be going back to the office. What are the rules going to be like with one office where in another country, another state, the, the rules are going to be different. The situation is going to be different. And how can we, we actually deal with it and support our employees because it's going to be, it's very unfamiliar. And trying to, to support our employees dealing with that kind of uncertainty is not easy or obvious. So last summer I was flying to Stockholm and sitting next to me, I started talking to this guy who happened to be on the board of the, one of the electric scooter companies. And he, um, he was telling me about the fact that he couldn't, um, 
he couldn't imagine. He, he himself was, I don't know, late 50s, had uh, already been a serial entrepreneur, uh, started, uh, launched and sold two different companies already. But he was telling me about the, the, the CEO of the electric scooter company. And he said, I couldn't have started up company that was distributed. They, they had made a strategic decision to launch in several countries at the same time. He said, I couldn't have done that. Not from the get go. I couldn't have kept everybody connected and, and really launched a company from the beginning across many countries until now. Now that he'd seen somebody else do it, now that he'd understood what the parameters were, how to do it, how to keep people connected, he thought he could. So we can learn different models. We can learn different ways to lead, even if we aren't all in the same place, even if we're dealing with very, very different circumstances across many different locations. So these are the things that we can sort of think about as we think about how to deal, how do we lead in times of uncertainty. And honestly, I didn't put this picture in there thinking that I was actually going to see riot police when I was out walking my dogs this morning. But I share this picture with you now because I was talking a couple of years ago to a group of mostly investors. And I was talking to them about empathy in leadership. And after I had finished my talk, uh, one of the gentlemen from the audience came up and he talked to me and he had been a Marine. And he said, absolutely. When it comes to, to leadership in the Marines, when you have extraordinarily stressful situations where you're dealing with a kind of unpredictability, you need to be able to adapt and pivot and think about what's coming at you next. Empathy is a critical skill for leaders because if they don't understand what each person in their team is capable of, what they can do to, to what, they, what they can do in a particular situation, what skills they're going to bring, how they're going to react, then the team is not going to be successful. So I'm talking about leading with empathy. And that's going to get us through our, for the most part, there have been some uh, expressions that it feels like war when we're dealing with the crisis that we have. And for some people, it has been extraordinarily tough. And there have been some terrible tragedies you know, in, in every country. But as we're moving forward in the work situation, we can take that understanding of empathy and how, why it matters so much when we have such an uncertainty and we're dealing with ex extraordinarily challenging situations and how that's going to support every one of your team in your department and across your company. What does empathy mean? Empathy so we're absolutely clear. It means putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and feeling what they're going through. Thinking about what they're going through and understanding how they see the world and really tapping into that. There are three different pieces to it to make it clear. It's thinking about how they see the world. You don't have to agree with it, but just trying to understand and using your curiosity and imagination to put yourself in their shoes and understand how they see things. Then it's, what do they feel? What are they actually, what do you correctly identify as being how they understand what, what emotion they're feeling? Is this young woman, does she have a headache? Is she stressed out because her connectivity is really bad right now? Or is she struggling with part of the project? So is it, is it pain? Is it frustration? Is it, who knows? But until you ask, until you can check in and make sure, you can't tap into what she's feeling and really put yourself in her shoes. So it can be a question of listening, of talking, of asking questions, listening to her tone of voice, but do check so you can really understand what that person is going through. And then what do you do as a result? How do you act? If you have more information about the, your team members, about what they're going through, because you've asked questions and you've understood more about what the situation is, what do you do then as a result? So once you've noticed those cues, how do you act? How do you incorporate that so that you can support them in their work so that they can be successful and everything can move forward appropriately? So what, how can we change? How can we change in order to change our style of leadership to adapt for these uncertain times, incorporating empathy? Well, of course, there are two pieces to it, really. It's internally, it is consciously 
um, adopting new leadership practices, which are, are, are incorporating your empathy skills more, and then applying that, applying that as you go out and you're dealing with your team and leading them through these difficult, difficult conditions that, that we're experiencing right now. First of all, in terms of internally, this is a question of transforming your mindset, your manner, and your, the model. So your mindset, this is about how you think about things, the attitude that you have. The manner is how you approach, how you carry yourself, how you approach others. And the model is setting the example so that people understand what, how, you are, um, how you have adopted a new way of being and how you're bringing that um, and reinforcing the messages that you, the new messages that you're, you're sharing with people. So in terms of mindset, open-mindedness is really critical when we're dealing with uncertainty. It's not just mindset, uh, uh, being open-minded about people, but that's really critical in terms of understanding the different perspectives, welcoming people's different ideas, mindsets, sharing helping them share amongst each other, having that cognitive diversity and creating a safe space so that people not only feel that they belong, but also feel comfortable because you're welcoming everybody's ideas. You're being inclusive and sharing data with them. You're really showing them that you trust them and allowing them to build up trust in you. Sharing that data so they understand what's going on and are able to then collaborate in a meaningful way. That open-mindedness also allows uh, you to be able to adapt when new information is coming in from the outside. When you're dealing with, with, with unpredictable uh, ways forward and, and you know, this is happening, there's a second wave coming in that particular country, what are you going to do? As this new information arrives, that open-mindedness allows you to look and think about all the different possibilities that might need to be considered. This is really critical. Thank you. I see there are questions coming up and I'm looking forward to addressing them in a little bit. An individualized approach is really critical when it comes to dealing with the type of, of conditions that we're dealing with right now. As you're being empathetic, it means that you're tapping into every single person as an individual and recognizing what they are uniquely capable of. And when you recognize them as an individual, that means that they understand what the, that you respect them. They're going to be able to share more. They're going to understand and trust you more. And when you have trust-based relationships, Collaboration increases, communication and, uh, increases, mis misinterpretations and misunderstandings decrease. And when you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty, when you're dealing with um, a lot of challenges, reducing um, in misinterpretations, reducing misunderstandings and have a clarity of communication because you are easy, it's easier to get on the same page, that's really important. Being an approachable and accessible is key when you're trying to, particularly when everybody is dispersed or some people in the office and some people are working from home. Heidi Mellon is the CMO of uh, Workfront, which is a, um, a, a work, workflow uh, management uh, soft pla platform. And she is an experienced remote leader and she uh, uses, make sure there are many different channels. She uses, happens to use Slack and an open calendar so that people really can easily um, access that. She's always been doing that. But now since March, what she's also added to that is having a Zoom room available and open at different times so people can just drop by. So she wants to make sure that she's access, as accessible as possible to her team and others. So that if there is a question, if there is a concern that people have, that they really do feel that, they, that they, are, they are comfortable to just drop by and just ask a question. And modeling that behavior is critical as well. Being vulnerable, being accessible, trying to be human. I mean, when have you found that you actually um, connected best with some of your team members? It was when you were being you. You were being vulnerable. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you were being silly. It was maybe, you know, showing that you have kids and, they're, and they were causing you problems and, and you, you brought them to sit and you knew you. Whatever it might be, being authentic, being real, and showing people that you know, you're all in this together, that's really going to help. And setting the example. If you, don't, if you don't show people, if you just tell people what to do, but don't actually do the same things yourself, what does that mean? 
if you've had something to somebody do that to you, you know how you feel. You're like, ah, they don't really mean it. So setting the example and really, you know, being the, the uh, example as you move forward and showing that the different types of behaviors that you're talking about and really listening to people and asking questions. That will also encourage them to act in the same way. So when you, when you show these kind of behaviors and you're supporting an empathetic environment, it is encouraging people to act in the same way back to you. But let's be clear, there isn't a right way or a wrong way. This, this isn't about you know, ones and zeros. These are continuums. And if it will be more effective if in this type of environment, when you have dealing with, with uncertain times, that you share more information. So can you move, how can you move along that continuum from closely held to more shared? If you have more open channels, it's going to be easier. You're going to be able to, to understand more about what's going on with your, your team members. They're going to share more back with you. The deeper the personal relationships that you have, it's going to be, you're going to be on the same page. You're going to have more shared experiences and commonality that are going to help you connect with them. They're going to trust you more and they're going to be able to speak up more and share their ideas. So just think about where you are on that continuum and just move, move along it in a way that's in the, along it to, to, to make it more successful um, in this environment. Okay, so now I'm going to ask, answer some questions. Okay, uh, as far as communication is a key point, how can a shy person be a leader? Communication isn't about necessarily speaking up and being the loudest person in the room, but it is about the more you that you can connect with people. And it, so it doesn't have to be very strong and overt communication. It can, it can be quiet. It can be uh, a, a much more uh, 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 settled uh, person who, who is not necessarily coming forth and being very open about things. So there are different ways to be a leader and the, the way that leadership is moving in this empathetic way is to, to be less overt, less dictatorial, but really encouraging people to, to be more autonomous, to take on more themselves. And that way, that, that's the type of leadership that a shy person can um, uh, uh, excel in um, more than the, the type of command and control that we've had in the past. So I do think this new type of empathetic leadership is really something that is, is helpful um, and supportive of more shy leaders. Uh, in which way do you see the new technologies will affect leadership and leaders? We're going to get onto technology in just a moment. So just um, that will come along. What would you say to be the right balance to connect with your team and be personal without too much familiarity? There, there are boundaries and there, it, is, it, it, it can be a sort of test to see where that boundary is appropriate. And, and it depends on the culture, it depends on the person. The key is to really to, to be able to connect. And it can be, uh, if you choose, if you think it's, it's the most appropriate thing, choose, um, it could be, a TV show that you, you both love. It could be um, a sports team. It doesn't have to be things that get too personal if that's some place that you feel could be inappropriate with that person or just might not make you feel comfortable or them. So it, it, there are ways to, to be able to connect with people. Also, you can create um, shared experiences. That means um, in the past and in the future, you know, it was like going bowling or going on corporate retreats or whatever that might be. But you can also do virtual things like uh, virtual uh, trivial pursuit um, and, and having non-work events. Those are the type of ways that you can connect with people um, without it becoming too personal and having, being able to understand people uh, d d more deeply and be able to connect with them in a different way. That's really going to help you understand them and be, be an empathetic leader. One more question um, right now. How is it possible for a staff member to have two managers, to have two managers get along? Encouraging empathetic behavior. So um, if you model empathetic behavior, it does encourage other people to do it. If you can, can overtly say, 
well, if I'm, if I'm putting myself, if I'm putting myself in your shoes and trying to understand how you are thinking about this, this is what I would think. How about thinking about, you know, from the, if, if it's two managers aren't getting along, trying to see, see it from the other person's perspective. One exercise that is useful is to try and get them to argue the other person's point of view. That often really helps people uh, try and find a different way of a different solution. Um, they see things in a different way when they have to argue somebody else's point of view. Let me have a look at the time. Oh, I'm going to ask once, one more question then. Um, I've had a career setback due to being bullied. I'm on maternity leave now, possibly diagnosed PTSD. How can I position myself to leadership when I return to work? That's a, a much longer answer. Um, I will say, and I'm happy to take that offline if you want to connect with me through LinkedIn. Um, I think there is, there's a, a, a situation that you can talk to HR about if depending on who that person is and if you are working closely with them, um, because bullying is, is a, a very difficult situation and really typically needs um, human resources to step in and change the dynamics and hopefully be able to separate you from that person as well as dealing with that person's behavior. So it is a much more involved situation um, uh, but being able to put you in a situ in in an environment where you can excel and you're not uh, being challenged by somebody else's inappropriate way of dealing with you. In uncertain times, is it also hard for leaders to stay motivated? Yes, it certainly can be. Um, it certainly can be. So um, I think the you know, having, we're going to get to culture in a little bit, but really focusing on the culture of your organization because the purpose and the mission of the, the company and where you're going, that can be really highly motivating to everybody, including you. So if that's an issue that you, uh, that you're, you, you're challenged with motivation, we all have our bad days. And, you know, these times, I mean, when I wake up to, to riot police and, and looting, you know, I'm like, you know, trying to work out which way is up. But you know, I think when we, when we really can, uh, can focus on what it is that we're ultimately trying to achieve, what are our goals, and then we can, we can actually get behind that and move, move forward. One more question. I think, because uh, I'm going to get to the technologies. All right, we're going to keep moving. So when it comes to, to what I'm calling externalized in terms of how you're taking this new approach to leadership and, uh, and practicing it in these different areas in order to transform uh, these different uh, areas in different ways so that you can be effective um, under these, these, these difficult conditions. We're going to start with talent. And um, oops. so we're going to start with talent. And what does that mean in terms of of what is your what is the approach that you have towards your talent, the relationships you have with your uh, your reports and your colleagues, but also how does your organization view uh, view talent management? How important is the talent agenda? There there are many organizations that have not focused for for the longest time on the people in the organization and, and understanding that the people are really the, the, the most important assets that, 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 that there are. And, and that really focusing on, on helping people do their best work individually and really supporting them, that's what's going to help the company be successful. And that is, that has never been so important as now when we're needing to, to every single person to be, to, uh, to work to their fullest and be able to collaborate with each other effectively. That is what is going to help your company and your team be successful. So having a look at some of these different questions, just giving you a few moments to just think through those and, and what the status is on your side. So what is a sustainable approach? Because some of the ways that we have, some of the ways that organizations have been dealing with their employees has not been sustainable. And I know that there's been an extraordinary amount of burnout among, at all levels of the organization. 
right now. We're dealing with, we've been dealing with a lot and particularly middle managers, those people who have, who have been just rising up through the ranks and been achieving levels of leadership and then suddenly tasked with extraordinarily different and unfamiliar and, and often uh, very challenging circumstances. If you're at home and you have small kids or you have elderly parents who, who need to be taken care of and need to be, have shopping bought for them because they can't go outside, these are very challenging conditions that you, when you have to get you know, do your, do your, your own job and you do your normal job at the same time, but in different circumstances. So how, what is the best way to be able to support each one of the people who's, who's working for you? Well, the first way I look at this is really to understand yourself. If I can understand, if I have more self-awareness about how I do my best work, then I'm going to be able to apply that better and understand each person that's on my team better. And one of the things that's interest, been interesting to me to see uh, how people have been reacting to working from home is that people have understood a lot more about their own personal preferences. Do I work better at night or in the morning? Uh, do, I, do I really, really miss the buzz of the office? Or am I super productive now? Some people have in, been increased, uh, been seeing increased productivity because this is the kind of environment that they really enjoy, notwithstanding the fact that they may also be feeling isolated, that they also are really missing all the others, the impact of the social um, connectivity that, that being meeting people in person has been able to give them. But we've had, we're starting to have much more awareness of how we work best. So when we understand that about ourselves, then we can actually really have a better understanding of each one of the people who works for us and what situations they're going to uh, excel in. And, you know, maybe there's somebody on your team that really, really is not good at nine o'clock in the morning. And so you know, if you're going to have a really important brainstorming session, maybe that shouldn't be at nine o'clock in the morning if you want them to do their best work. I actually came across this woman and she, uh, her best time of the day is four o'clock in the afternoon, which is extraordinary because I think most of us are, are kind of asleep at that time, but, or sort of feeling very dozy, but that's her best time. So how can we understand ourselves and each other so that we can be most effective, putting yourself in their shoes and understanding what helps them excel. So understanding each employee individually and then empowering people. How can you best allow them to make the decisions? What decisions, what uh, information do they need? How can you empower them so that they can actually make timely uh, decisions and have the information to go ahead, whether it's a customer feedback or it's information about what's going on in that particular marketplace or in that uh, that different office because the that the restrictions are easing differently in that country or that city. Empowering people as an empathetic leader, you actually have a better understanding of what they are capable of individually, and what what situations are going to uh, stress them out. What what how you can support them differently. And if you can survey people, it may seem like an annoyance at times, but that kind of information, if you're regularly going out, gathering information and making sure that you do understand what people want, what people need, because they do have very different needs, desires and situations. So really um, connecting with people to, to get a good sense of what's going on and share the improvements. So they do know that you're taking, taking this information on board and doing something with it. Promoting healthy habits. I love this guy doing, you know, doing his yoga or sitting on, on the, uh, the board of the river. We all need to be practicing healthy habits. Again, making sure that you're setting the example and you're not saying, yes, yes, yes. Make sure you get, you know, your exercise, but then don't give somebody any time to be able to do that. We do need in, in these difficult times when we are dealing with uh, different stress levels, uh, different amount, very unfamiliar ways of doing things. And we're, we're being expected to collaborate and, and cooperate in, in, in ways that we haven't been tasked to before. We need to really be making sure that we're supporting ourselves, looking after ourselves, but also, and also our team members. Tailoring benefits you know, is not something you're necessarily focused on now, but it also helps people. Somebody, want, might, somebody might want a gym membership, somebody else might want nutrition help. These type of things, as we're moving into 
continued uncertainty um, will be important to enable each person dealing with their particular struggles or, or, or challenges is going to be helpful. Um, and mental health, do make sure that in all the different offerings that you have and you're supporting employees and their well-being, financial support and well and mental health support are going to be critical. Helping people, helping uh, manage their, their finances, particularly if there has had to be a reduction in salaries because you're trying to make sure people keep their jobs, you know, understanding that they will have, you know, some, may have some, some serious financial challenges as a result. And recognition. People are different and they'd like to be rewarded and or recognized in different ways. Some people may like just a shout out on a video chat. Uh, somebody else may just really appreciate a one-on-one -on -one email just saying, hey, you did a great job. Understanding what resonates with people is going to help them be motivated and really uh, do, do, you know, go above and beyond as you move forward. So trying to take um, a little bit of, of, of paying a little bit of more of attention to, to see what makes a difference to each different person on your team and in your department is going to make a big, big difference in terms of, of being a, people being able to pull out the stops and achieve things that they weren't necessarily, um, that they either thought they were possible or when you, then there's a particular challenge, a big pivot that needs to happen, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to deal with that? And let's, let's remember that the times of uncertainty, it's not just about the uncertainty that each one of us has been dealing with in terms of in our work situations and where we're working. Are we working at home? And, and you know, what are the challenges we're facing there? It's also, we're also the consumers. And different people in different locations, in different cities, in different countries, in different states, they're also reacting to these different uncertain times. So recognizing that that your marketplace is going to be changing and how people are going to, to be buying your services and products will be different. It may be different in different places and pivoting and making sure that you're addressing the different audiences and making sure that you're gathering that information so that you can be, be really um, on top of the different um, environments and, and the changing needs internally and externally is going to be very important. Next technology. So just taking a second to have a look at the different of the status for your company and your department in terms of how quickly you're able to adapt, um, what, what are the changes that need to be made as you're moving forward, um, and all the security issues, for example. Again, this recording is going to be available afterwards. I'm not expecting, obviously, for you to be able to, to look at all of these uh, uh, questions and give you know thorough answers, but these are important to just have a take have a um, an understanding of where you are right now, and have a think when you're going through this 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 presentation and going through this video afterwards. What are the changes that you can make that are going to enable you to be able to lead your team, your department, your company more effectively as you move forward? What is going to be supportive? of your company's uh, business in unpredictable circumstances and obviously supporting the workforce. What do they need? Well, they need information. They need the data that's going to be able to allow them to understand what's going on in a particular marketplace in that particular situation is what I'm expecting to happen. This is where we're really going to be need to be testing our hypotheses. I was expecting that. Did that happen? If not, have you empowered somebody to be able to make a change based on that information? And it does everybody, wherever they're working, have equal access, equitable access to the, tech, to the data they need, the resources they need, and the platforms so that everybody can be communicating and collaborating and working effectively no matter where they are. And that also means if I'm going to be sometimes half in the office, I know in Paris, there's some, um, they've eased the restrictions. So, so sometimes there's team A that's in the office Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and team B is Tuesdays and Thursdays for different hours. Well, depending on where I'm working, I still need to be able to work as effectively. So how can we do that? What, in what in, um, information do they need? What equipment do they need? How do people need to be supported? What channels are they most comfortable using? And if people aren't comfortable using 
uh, Zoom or WebEx or whatever it might be, and they really aren't familiar um, or comfortable and uh, using video uh, communications tools, and that's distracting them from being as effective in their work, then give them training support. Help them get that problem out so they can just focus on their work and really be interacting easily and comfortable because that's the way they're going to speak up. That's the way they're going to be, be able to brainstorm and contributing as much as possible. And don't forget security. This is an issue. We've obviously all heard about the issues with Zoom and security there. So make sure these things are taken care of. Teamwork. So teamwork in distributed uh, teams, decentralized teams can be challenging. I, I imagine that all of you have been, uh, may have been burned out with so many Zoom calls and lots of people and how you do it. And, but teamwork actually is quite new for all of us. It's been increasing over the last um, decade, two decades, because we've been going away from independent work. We've been dealing with much more, many more complicated uh, uh, problems and we're needing to bring in uh, more people to, to debate the, 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 the problems to, and also it's including more cross-functional um, more, more cross-functional discussion. So we'll be needing to, to communicate and interact with people across different disciplines which, who we don't necessarily um, understand in the same way as people in our own team. So what is the situation now in your, in your office environment? How productive have team situations been? Have they been able to, to brainstorm easily together? Um, how well connected are the people in your teams? Do they have strong relationships already? Because that's going to make a difference when they're trying to, uh, to collaborate. If they, if they do have good relationships, they're going to be able to, to communicate and, and brainstorm easily together. And we talk about blended teams as well. Blended teams are when you have not just employees, but also um, uh, freelancers and independent contractors who are part of that. And that may, that may have increased if, if some employees have been furloughed and they're being brought back, not as employees, but as part-timers, or maybe you're, you're hiring different part-timers because you're trying to go in a slightly different direction based on, on uh, new, the new working, new business parameters. So trying to make sure that those people included, how, how is that happening right now? I love this, uh, I love this picture. This is actually, was actually posted on LinkedIn. It was a team from Walmart. They are, they are actually all supposed to be social distancing. Um, and they had been moving product. They've been bringing uh, pallets of, of, of food products in, turning it around and getting it out. And they had actually, uh, broken a record for how much product they'd managed to shift in one day. And this was celebrated by their boss, the boss's boss, who was really uh, excited and, and really trying to, to recognize all the efforts, the extraordinary efforts they put in, trying to be safe, um, but working very closely together. So what is it that's going to be right for your team? Because we're dealing with very different situations. We're dealing with... Um, you know, social distancing, what does that mean? How can, you, how can that work at the office? Who's going to be there? Who's not going to be there? But trying to, to set the team up for success means really encouraging soft skills, particularly practicing empathy, making sure that you're using video as much as possible. And I know people are getting burned out, but by the same token, it also gives you that much more information. You have more cues and clues. You can see if people are really engaged, if they're kind of like feeling down or dejected. And have you know proper meeting protocols? Is every meeting justified? Seventy percent of employees before this thought the meetings were a waste of time. Well, let's just focus in on the meetings that we need to have. Some can be recorded, and people can listen to it when they actually have you know time time later on. So it's not just disrupting them getting on with the tasks that they need to do right now. Also, this idea of making sure that teams are connected, that they are, they have better relationships and having non-work events, which could for now may still be much more online and virtual. It could be virtual happy hour. If I know we may be burned out about that, but you know, it could be, uh, there are, there are different things that you can do to make sure that people have non-work time to connect, to share what they're going through, to be able to vent, to be able to share with you as well. 
And those, those deeper relationships are really going to improve how well the team works together. And being able to integrate, integrate uh, freelancers, people who aren't employees, so that they have access to the information that they need and can, can get on with the tasks um, they have. Process and performance means really understanding the work that needs to be done, who it is best assigned to, and then evaluating how successfully it was done and being able to adapt if needs be. So how well was your team, you and your team able to react based on what you understood about the work that flows through your division, through the, your, your team? And how have you been uh, forecasting work. We are now, the, the, prior to um, the beginning of this year, work has been evolving. It has been changing based on technology. It is, that's what one of the huge drivers of the future of work is this evolving nature of work because we can't for, 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 forecast out as much as far because technology has been changing things. As we use different technologies and different applications and as customers are able to communicate back to us, we're having to adapt, we're having to upgrade and change our products and services quickly. And that means we don't forecast out as far and it means things get productized. So how can people do their best work? How can the, you support them in order that they can really get allocated the work that needs to be done. And how do they know what's going to be done? It really is a question of being very clear about blocking and, and tackling, understanding how the work gets broken down so that who it can be assigned to appropriately. And this makes a, a, a big difference when we're thinking about pivoting. Because if, if situations change, we need to, one, have thought about the different ways it could change based on maybe there's a second wave, maybe there's um, a, a problem with that particular supply chain that we thought there was a different solution over here, but that hasn't worked. Looking at all the different scenarios, you need to be working contingencies into the plan. Think about your team. You don't want them to be in a situation where they have no idea what to do. Think about what situation this uncertainty, what situation the uncertainty is going to put them in. You can think about what's the be next best action and allow them, everybody can be debating the different scenarios that, that, are, are, that could be possible so that when you get into information, you can work out which way you need to proceed. So creating these scenarios is going to be supportive of your team members so they have the understanding, they know what the trigger points are and what they need to do. And talking about actually a great story about uh, uh, pivoting and changing, a friend of mine in Australia was talking to me about a theater. Uh, they make stages. They make sets and stages in theaters. And when everything shut down in March, they were like, okay, what do we do? What can we do? We have a lot of wood and we have amazing carpentry skills. They pivoted and they've been making desks, these beautiful wood desks, absolutely stunning. They, won't, they will be pivoting again as soon as the, the theaters can open up. But these are some of the more radical ways that we can change when we look at the possibilities and the different scenarios um, that were available to us. Performance and actions. So managing employees as individuals means that the different people, some people can be given one, uh, just a deadline and they'll be fine about that. Other people need more rallying along the way. They need more, more milestones. Just people are supported um, differently. And matching those reviews, we have already been moving away from the one time a year or maybe twice a year um, and the reviews. Now, when we're dealing with this type of, of change and we're not quite sure, all of us, how we're moving forward, checking in at least once a week, making sure people know what's going on. Do they have any questions? As long as you are accessible, they may come to you, but check in with them so you can course correct as you're moving forward. And this is a very different type of leadership that you're expecting from managers, that they're going to be coaching people, they're going to be helping motivate people. This is we're all being expected to chip in and, and participate and be much more involved than we ever have. 
culture and values. I'm just checking the time. Culture and values. Culture and values are really critical because they create the ground, the, the, the environment that, we, that supports us being able to work well. I put these towards the end, even though it's so important, is because it takes longer to change culture and values. But to somebody's point earlier, um, we'll, we'll get to in terms of the, the mission and the vision. How clearly do people understand within your organization, do they understand the culture and values? And are those, do you find that those are the most positive uh, values that are going to be the right ones that are going to help support everybody as we move forward in this type of environment? Because this uncertainty, I'm anticipating this is going to be going on for many months. There might be a second wave in you know, end of June, beginning of July. There might be a second or third wave in the fall. So we will not be able to predict how these things are going to be rolling out with any kind of uncertainty until we're much further along. So culture is going to be incredibly important. Being able to help ground people um, as we move forward is going to be important. And what, is that, what does that nurturing culture look like? It is about the mission. It is about the, pur the, the, the purpose and, and, and helping that helps motivate people. It helps align people, even yourself. And that, cult, that company culture, if you can articulate it, if you can easily uh, share that with people and live it on a daily basis. And timeless values are really important. Things like empathy or integrity or, on, or honesty or family. Um, a client of mine was going through a huge growth phase. This was prior to COVID, but he, he and his team had a very strong sense of family. That was one of their company values. And that really connected them and aligned them and helped them get through um, this very challenging growth phase. So choose the, the highlight, those cultural values that are appropriate for your organization, but the timeless ones are the ones that are going to help ground you and anchor you um, as uh, in, in order to, to help people be, be focused on what they need to focus on and the rest becomes more of a distraction. General integration, I'm going to rush through this, but this is really, really important. We all have differences. We're all individuals first and we're all different. There are some differences that I do see uh, between generations and that's a lot to do with how intuitively uh, people do or don't interact with technology. The way I see it as we move forward is really critical that we're working together. So here's some, some things just to think about. Again, look to the video afterwards and go through things, things and just have a look at your organization and how well uh, generations are working together. How can you connect people across generations? There are many things that can be done. There are uh, cross-generational uh, committees that you can have. Really, uh, mentoring programs are very good for that. Um, and there's a lot of shared, uh, shared knowledge, whether it's technology and experience, but it's really bringing all, it's the combination of our experience and our expertise and our understanding about technology or our experience of the things that we've done in the past, that's what's going to help us deal with these new situations, which have much, which are more digitized, we're dealing with a lot more automation, hopefully so that we can actually focus on the really difficult problems and make sure that events, I put a foosball table in here kind of as a joke, because um, it always sort of brings up, uh, roll, there's either you know, eyebrows, eyebrows being raised or, or eyes rolling, but it doesn't matter what it is. It's, it's it, have events that are engaging to all ages because that's what's going to bring people together, have those shows experience so they can connect. And last of all, skills and careers. How are we doing for time? Okay, we'll just take one more minute to do this. Skills are really, really important as well as careers and how we're moving forward so that we can have the skills that we need. You can have the skills that you need as a leader and empathy is definitely one of them but we typically don't actually know. If I, think, if I had the ability to actually ask you to tell me what your three top skills are, most of you wouldn't know. That's just typical. But understanding what our skills are now, because we've been sort of defined by our jobs, but understanding what our skills are now, and we need to be um, updating our skills and looking, looking forward to see what skills we're going to be needing. And every single one of our team, what do they need and helping them develop their career. We aren't focused on careers right now, and it's, that's totally understandable. But we do need to understand that careers, particularly for the younger 
younger generations, the people who you want to be your emerging leaders, they really need to understand where their careers are going. So how can you develop the potential? Well, it's really making sure that you understand your team's skills, what discuss career possibilities with them, motivate them, help them understand where you see them going, what the possibilities could be. That's really going to help them tap into to themselves, help them self-manage their careers because careers are much more so self-directed now, but also make sure that you're planning for those skills because in, in all the things that we're doing, we are being more challenged. We're being, we're being asked to step up to the plate in all kinds of ways and using different technologies that we haven't, and we need to get some training to help with that. Now, okay, I have four more minutes. So any questions? I'm going to, let's get the questions going. All right. So uh, how to get honest feedback about your leadership and methods from the team? Well, uh, if you are showing empathy and you really are being open and honest about your successes and your failures, if you are nurturing an environment where people are encouraged to be real, to be truthful, that means for you too, and being open and being human, then people will be more encouraged to actually be honest with you and share, share the positives and the negatives. So it really is demonstrating it yourself and having the right, the, the, the positive environment um, that is supportive of that. There are also ways to, to train people to give feedback. Some people really don't appreciate um, feedback. Um, a lot of people really want it, but having it, doing it so that it's, it's, uh, it's positively received um, is a skill. So that, that can be a very good idea um, to, to help people with. Um, in today's world, you know, tied up back-to-back -back calls on different matters. Do you see meetings calls evolving, becoming shorter and efficient and shorter? Yes. Well, this is my thing. Um, really being thinking about who actually needs to be in the meeting, who actually needs to be on the call. And there are things that can be done. If it's an important meeting, um, if it's a call with many people, definitely you need to use video. But there are things that can be done a asynchronously. You can use chat channels. You can, there are ways to, to make, try and connect with people on the platform that they're most comfortable with when it comes to, to understanding how important an issue is and how it would most quickly and efficiently be tackled. Because not everything needs to have a whole meeting at all. And that, that's the, one of the critical things to, particularly in this environment, where we're actually doing, dealing with much more than we ever have, is making sure that we're using our time um, efficiently. Um, how can leaders ensure that team members work together in a kind and fair way and assure that the staff members are not in competition with one another? Okay. So some people like to, to stimulate uh, competition with each other. The key thing for me is to, to, to focus on results. I didn't stress that enough earlier. But if you focus on results, it really helps people get focused on the end game. And when you have team results, if you focus more on what I have to get done and don't understand how that fits into the whole picture, then I'm going to get <clears throat> excuse me more competitive with my team with my teammate. But if you're helping your team focus on everybody has to do their thing and it's, it's going to get us towards that goal, that's going to be a key thing that's going to, to, to help them push aside some of that, that comp compet competition with each other and actually focus on the end game. In terms of uh, working together in a kind and fair way, that really, really comes down to this idea of empathy. If you are showing people the behavior that you see in someone who is successful and a leader and manages to accomplish things, then you are showing them that that's how, that that's how they will, can behave and they will be successful and rewarded for it. So that really is a, showing them the kind of behavior that is, will determine their ability to be successful. Because in this, this kind of environment, that kindness, that empathy that you have for your team members is really going to help them be successful and you all together be successful and focus on the end game and focus on results. Um, one question, one of our operations managers has trouble dealing with empathy and always comes out too strong to her team. What can I do to help her become a more empathetic leader? She's a great manager otherwise. Well, okay. So she's a great manager otherwise. So, so some of the things is you can be 
encouraging her when she's doing it the right way. If people are trying to be a good manager and they are succeeding in some ways, you can teach that behavior. And, you know, if there's been a really positive interaction and she's been a great manager, they go, oh my God, that was so great. I mean, you can reinforce that behavior. And then when there's been other way, some other behavior, if depending on the kind of relationship that you have with her, or maybe somebody else does, there could be some feedback that can help her understand the moments that she's being, she's doing it well, and the moments that she isn't being um, as supportive a leader um, as needs to be. So there are, the good thing is that there are some, some successes um, that can really be pointed to and steering her in the way of that behavior. Um, and, you know, identify where those particular moments are that, that you can also be p potentially mirroring the right behavior um, and, uh, or rather, showing her the right behavior and then encouraging her back to actually behave in the same, in the same way that you are. I hope that uh, if you, anybody has in, any more questions for me, please, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Sophie Wade. Uh, I have here are all my details in terms of how you can connect with me. Uh, there are all kinds of things that I do to help companies really uh, develop their, uh, their, their teams, um, it, be able to have the kind of, of environment at, at their um, offices, um, across all the different locations that their teams, their blended teams may be, um, and really being able to help people do their best work and interact and collaborate um, in the best way possible. So this, these are extraordinary times, and I really appreciate how much that you are looking to try and adapt and be able to be the best leader possible considering this, uh, these, these times. So do go back, have a look at all of those questions, see where you are. Again, there's no right or wrong answer, but if you can move yourself along some of those continuums and move towards mm -hmm. some of these uh, different new, more empathetic behaviors, I guarantee you will see some great results. And with that, I think, Oh my goodness, I've gone across time. I do apologize for going over time, but um, it's been a, a great pleasure. Please uh, do uh, ask me any questions you might have, look at the video afterwards, um, and uh, I look forward to, to hearing from some of you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.